Welcome back to another episode of Tank Talks. I'm your host, Matt Cohen. And in this week's episode, we dig into the heart of defense tech investing with VC Jake Chapman from Mark Ventures. Jake takes us through his venture journey, explaining why he decided to launch Mark Ventures and how the recent surge in defense tech investments by generalist VCs is due to the geopolitical shifts and technological innovations happening, particularly in AI, cybersecurity, and autonomous systems. We tackle challenges like navigating lengthy development cycles, regulatory hurdles, and ethical questions in defense tech. And plus, Jake offers advice on DoD procurement, the value of defense for strategies, and leveraging public engagement for sector awareness. Finally, we explore the role of strategic partnerships and the future of a more diverse group of buyers for M&A in the defense tech markets. Now, let's jump into the tank for this week's episode with Jake Chapman from Mark Ventures. Thanks for joining us in the tank today, Jake. Yeah, thanks for having me, Matt. You know, Jake, your journey into the venture world is quite interesting. You know, I believe we met when you were actually running Alpha Bridge Ventures back in 2019. But for those listeners who might not be so familiar with you, it'll be great to get a brief background on your path into venture and technology and how you eventually made your way into the defense world. I mean, people always want to know how folks get into venture, right? And I find it to be super idiosyncratic, so it's hard to offer advice. Mine was definitely no more direct than anyone else's. I started out as a lawyer doing fund formation, realized very early on in my career that uh, I hated being a lawyer and loved what my clients were doing. All my clients were VCs and really wanted to get to the other side of the table. I mean, I'd always been a bit of a, of a geek, read a lot of sci-fi growing up, still do. Wanted to be closer to the tech and closer to the entrepreneurship. So I only practiced for a couple of years. I am still technically a lawyer, although I avoid practicing whenever I can. Practiced for a few years. I worked in startups for a couple of years, founded a couple of companies, neither of which were super successful. Actually, the company that's been most successful that I founded was the third company. And I never spent a day on the leadership team there. We just helped put it together and we brought everyone in. So I don't know what that says about me as a CEO, but um, founded a couple, sold one, and the acquirer let me start their corporate venture program after a number of years. So for a couple of years, I was there. general counsel, had a strategy for the company, and then was able to ultimately convince the founders to, to launch a corporate venture program. And that's where I started my investing career. I was not doing defense at the time. I was a generalist, invested for a few years, did really well there, left and started my own firm. And then over time, was investing more and more in deep tech. All of my companies should have been trying to sell to the DoD, but had no idea how. Also invested in a company called Shift that places active duty military personnel inside venture firms and have had more fellows at this point than any other investor working with me over the last several years. So my career moved more and more towards defense, I think, as a result of having companies that should have been working with DoD um, and having active duty personnel inside the firm. And about four years ago, decided that's really what I wanted to pursue over the rest of my career, maybe five years ago now. So I left the firm I founded to start a new firm and was asked by a friend of mine, Peter Dixon at Second Front Systems, who's now running for Congress um, here in California. He asked if I'd come in and, and try and fix Army Venture Capital, which was the DOD's version of InQtel. So it sounded like a great opportunity. Came in, spent two years working with the government, trying to fix their internal defense venture organization. Absolute disaster of an organization um, before I got there. We couldn't really fix it. I mean, we uh, we came up with a plan. We spent a lot of time working with Congress, a lot of time working with the services, mostly the Army. And at the end of that, decided um, it really needed to just be shut down. So we we took the team, we left, we started Mark Ventures, and that's what we do now. That's the that's the story. Wow, <laughs> what a concise background. I mean, going from Coolies, I'm sure the attrition at Coolies is probably pretty high for people going into serving what their customers are doing. But you know, that whole journey of like being a part of startups, being a part of ones that were successful that you weren't really a part of on a day-to-day -day basis, and then getting brought in for Army Venture Capital. I had never even heard of Army Venture Capital until I saw it on your profile. Everyone's obviously heard of Incutel, which is like one of the most prolific investors from the US government. But Army Venture Gap, I had never heard of, and it now makes sense because it doesn't exist anymore. I mean, during your time there, obviously you went in with some pretty high expectations, but was it just the sort of bureaucratic red tape we all expect was actually proven true as to why you couldn't get this thing fixed? A fair, a fair amount of it. There's certainly some bureaucratic red tape. There were some um, legal questions, some pushback on the old authorities of the organization. So there was some, I mean, this is like bureaucratic minutia, but was the organization actually still an authorized organization or was the fact that Congress hadn't appropriated money to them in, you know, 15 years, some sort of implication that Congress had, you know, legislative intent to let it die. I mean, we, uh, we fought many odd bureaucratic battles over our, our short time there. 
Well, either way, you know, defense investing is still something that exists and something that you are obviously spending your life dedicated to, as you said, started Mark Ventures with, you know, the focus on defense tech as a conversation today, just setting the stage, you know, PitchBook reported that 8.4 billion was invested in US and European defense tech startups in 2022. CB Insight says it's over 11 billion globally in the same year. And, you know, let's just say defense tech is taking a lot of the headlines lately. And I'd love to just get your thoughts on what's driving the reported increase in effect defense tech investing, you know, and what do you see the big tailwinds happening, obviously, for you to have started Mark Ventures to be focused on defense tech? When we started the Army Venture Capital Project, you know, several years ago now, we tried to catalog everyone who was doing defense investing um, and taking it seriously. And I think here in the States, it was maybe five or six firms that we can quibble about firms, you know, seven through 10 if they take it seriously. But, um, and it was the people you'd expect. It was 8VC and Lux and Founders Fund and, you know, a couple of others in QTEL obviously. That list now, the last time I counted, was like over 120. I don't know how serious number 120 is taking it. You know, probably not that seriously, right? Because they were probably doing crypto um, six months ago. They'll probably be doing crypto again, right? It's it's taken off. So uh, maybe we're down to 119 now. But I mean, there's there's definitely been a a big influx of folks investing in the space. Most at the seed and pre-seed, I think not a a lot of new entrants at Series A and later. Um, So we'll see how that plays out. But you're right. Like it's definitely a trend. It's definitely hot right now. Um, if I have to guess, I'd say you know part of that is driven by Andreessen and American Dynamism. I think they are phenomenal at branding. That brand and their capital has made it a safe space for other investors to start coming in and investing. Although I think you know if you talk to the the AD team, it means a lot more to them than than just defense. It's education and energy and all sorts of stuff, but it has I think the public perception is that it is an investment in defense. So, I think it's part of it. Uh I, I don't think we can discount the war in Ukraine and tensions between sort of the West and China over Taiwan and certainly now, you know, October 7th and the the war in Gaza and Israel and potentially broader conflict, like there are just a lot of flashpoints, geopolitical flashpoints that I think have made defense a little bit more salient. Um, and so that's that's definitely bringing people in. And then you have, you know, Andrel and Palantir and Epirus and Shield AI and a few other examples that are maybe leading the way and showing that you can be successful in defense. And then you asked what I think are like trends. Yeah. What are your thoughts on it? Exactly. So it's it's everything I just said. It's the it's the mega trends in the world are driving more conflict. That's not changing anytime soon. American security commitments aren't going down. If anything, they're going up. You have big changes happening in terms of political pressure to diversify the defense industrial base, right? So to expand beyond the traditional five primes. We'll see if there's any fruit at the end of the day in those efforts. Um, there's definitely it's been slower than people would like. But certainly the pressure at the top is there to make it happen. There's some inevitability to large parts of the defense budget, U.S. defense budget, almost a trillion dollars. You know, we'll call it 900 billion, but what's 100 billion amongst friends to take some of that and move it to startups. Um, and some of the pressure is caused by the fact that, you know, U.S. debt as a function of GDP is higher than it's ever been. And U.S. defense spending as a percentage of GDP is near all time lows. But security commitments aren't going down. So we have the quintessential, you know, immovable object versus unstoppable force. Like, how do we square this circle? And I think the only answer to squaring the circle ultimately is to move more of our defense spending from the primes who have bloated cost structures to startups who can deliver capability at a better price point. The only question is when, right? And so much of venture is about timing. I, of course, I want to double click on that, right? You say like geopolitical influences with the war in Ukraine and the Middle East, obviously we know drive business and markets forward for the neocons in Washington who obviously benefit from these global conflicts. But, you know, how are these changes in AI and cybersecurity and autonomous systems helping to bring more efficiency and hopefully cost down for the military applications that they're building for when you have such bloated prime structures that benefit and gobble up almost a majority of that. Like what's going to be the change? If you're saying it's happening at the top, why is it not happening? Just as there's political pressure to start diversifying the base, there's always political pressure to send contracts to the primes, right? I mean, the F-35, I think, is made in every single congressional district except for one. Or there's subcontractors who produce parts in every district except for one. And there's a reason for that. That is not accidental. 
And I'm, I think the one district that does not have a, a Lockheed contract for the F-35 is like Upper East Side in Manhattan. So I'm sure it's like there's not a single storefront. You know, there's no one who could sell a bolt or a nut or, you know, stitch a, you know, part of the like upholstery on a seat or anything. It was not overlooked. So there's always that pressure to keep contracts with the primes, uh, which is not a criticism of the primes. I think I might be one of the few folks in this industry that I don't, I don't blame the primes for what they are and what they do. They have optimized for a certain set of incentives. And so if we want behavior to change at the primes, it's all about, it's on us to change the incentive structures. It's not really on them. They're a business. So yeah, what's going to change? I think you hit on some of it. Um, I think some of the new technology trends out there are going to drive cost reductions. Um, and we'll take AI as an example, because I think it's a great one. I was talking with a company a few months ago. I love what they're doing. They're called OpenX. They do um, training for the DOD and for others in aerospace. And their training is, um, it's vocational training. So it is, how do you use this mill? You know, how do you, you know, weld this kind of part? How do you fix the composites on a B2, right? So like very, very like technical uh, training focused on the department. For them to do a training module traditionally might've been several months to put together the materials and create a new training module. Now they can do it in a matter of weeks because they use generative AI to help compile the materials and refine the lessons, right? Um, so we're talking about, you know, a 10x or better improvement in productivity for what used to be a, a several month process. I think that's going to play out all across the department in both little and big ways. So let's talk about that company because obviously selling to the DOD is an incredibly difficult process to go through a procurement you know, process. We have a company called Omelas who has luckily secured contracts with the DOD and gotten paid for it, but there's always delays. You know, how long is this development uh, cycle in de- you know developing the de- defense projects uh, for the DoD, and how does that affect your investment strategy to time it right? And maybe share some insights on how to simplify, you know, or if I dare say, make the process easier when selling to the DoD through their procurement process for startups. There is no easy answer, and it's it's pretty idiosyncratic as well. So there are a few companies that have navigated the process very well and have moved quickly from prototype to contract, actual actual procurement contract. But that's rare. And some of it is luck, right? I mean, if you were building the greatest piece of technology that was GWAT relevant, the global war on terrorism, and then we pivoted to great power conflict, uh, it doesn't matter what your priorities were. Like congressional priorities changed and you're sort of out on an island, right? The big FARA uh, cancellation, so the reconnaissance helicopter, which made news uh, this past week, it was a $20 billion program, $2 billion had been spent, program got canceled. And a lot of that is because of Ukraine, um, because we have seen that helicopters aren't all that survivable against a peer adversary, and that killed the program. And I, I applaud that because we have new facts, and so we should respond to new facts rather than push through a program that's probably not going to be effective against a peer adversary. Let's say you don't get unlucky and you're not like struck down by the angry DOD gods. The way you sell to the DOD more quickly is that you don't spend all your time in R&D land. It is fine to work with the, you know, Undersecretary of Defense for Research and Engineering and all of the groups under her organization. It is fine to apply for SBIRs, right? Take that non-dilutive grant funding. But what is really important for founders to know is that none of that funding or 99% of that funding doesn't lead anywhere. There is no prize at the end of that road. There is no contract waiting for you. There is no introduction to someone on the acquisition and sustainment side of the house. They just don't have those internal bridges. And there's plenty of anecdotes I can share with you of people who thought they were going to get a contract out of it that didn't get anything. So what's important is if you're doing that work, you have to be doing the same work on the acquisition side of the house So that the PEOs, the people who actually send out real procurement contracts, know who you are, are tracking your progress, and are, in an ideal scenario, building you into their next five-year plan. You have a company that uh, did it well, right? Uh, Mock Industries, I believe, that was backed by Sequoia? Yeah, I mean, Mock has has navigated um, pretty well. Like They're they're a sharp team, and so they're definitely on everyone's radar, uh, which is important in this process. And I'd say the other two things that most founders are not thinking about because most founders aren't building for defense or haven't come from the the industry is the requirements process, right? So no matter how cool your widget is, if the DOD hasn't officially recognized a requirement to buy it, they just can't buy it at scale. So you'll never sell massive quantities of it. You've got to have someone run that process. 
Um, and then Congress. Everybody who is working in defense or building a company in defense needs to know a fair number of the members of HASC and SASC and appropriators on the right committees. Because again, DOD, almost a trillion dollar budget, it is the most constrained of all federal agencies and how it spends its money. Congress has, has the handcuffs on DOD. They say exactly how that money gets spent. That has to get incorporated through the budgeting process. And so you, as a startup founder, need to know your Congress people, need to know their priorities. They need to know who you are so that if you match a priority, they can start the budget process for you. And it's really the only way to be successful in the space, I think, building a, a young company. I mean, that sounds like the most entangled web of chess <laughs> that I've ever heard for a startup who usually only has, you know, two years of runway or less, let's say, uh, at the whims of some, you know, DOD god to cancel an entire program that you've been building into. How do you wrestle with that as a VC investor whose job it is to obviously, you know, create equity value and return capital to LPs uh, when you're uh, at the mercy of things that are not necessarily in your control? I was at a conference late last year and uh, wanted to throw something. There was a, a person on stage, I won't say who they're with, but they're a, a senior DOD official with one of the service branches. They were saying that they like the Valley of Death, that the Valley of Death serves an important purpose, right? Their argument was, we shouldn't be working with every startup. We should be working with the best. So only the best technology should make it through the gauntlet. And the reason I wanted to throw something, what made me so angry is that she had a total misconception of what the Valley of Death actually is. It isn't some well thought out process that filters for the best technologies, the best companies, the real DOD needs. It is a random process that reaches out and kills things randomly and lets things through randomly. And that is not, that is not a good process. That's not how you should run it. And so it was just a, a misunderstanding of the on the ground truth about what's actually happening. You know, you've got names like Anderol and Varda that are obviously high profile names that take a lot of attention. But the funding, like from the government side, takes a long time to get into the hands of these companies. So what advice are you giving your portfolio companies to sort of bridge that gap before they really lock in those large revenue jetting contracts to stay alive long enough through Death Valley? Raise enough when you're raising. You know, this is a capital intensive space and the government, when it becomes a customer, is a great customer, but it takes a long time to get them there. So you've got to raise enough to understand those market dynamics and to get through the, the hurdles. Use the non-dilutive funding if you need it and while you can and start the process to get to contract on day one, not on the day when you think you have something that's saleable. You've got to start earlier. Um, it's the congressional education. It's the working the requirements process. It's the product development. All have to happen concurrently. Look, imagine a bike lock that has you know four tumblers on it. All four of those tumblers have to be aligned to get the lock open. Once the lock opens, you've got a procurement contract, and you're golden. So you've got a customer for 10 or 20 or 30 years that has massive budgets. And so if you can serve their needs, you have a customer for effectively life. It's all a matter of aligning the, the numbers the right way. And some of those processes take years, which means you can't start them the day you're ready to sell the product because you'll be out of business by the time you align the tumblers. You got to start aligning the tumblers on day one. So the day you're ready to sell the product, they're ready to buy it. Got it. And I assume that's what your role at Mark Ventures- And hope you don't get struck by yeah, lightning. Uh, with a cancellation at the last minute. Uh, you know, I guess that's where Mark Ventures comes in. You know, Tell us a little bit about the fun model, You know, the stage at which you try to focus on, and how you help those tumblers get locked into the right places as your companies start to mature, I assume, from like the early stage and beyond. Yeah. So, I mean, Mark Fund One, um, we just wrapped in December. We wrote our last check out of that fund. That was uh, pre-seed to Series A focus fund. We had one investment that was a little bit later from a progress perspective, they really were a S series A stage company. We say we're defense focused. So we're not sector focused, we're industry focused. And that's really where our expertise is. But there are sectors we care a lot more about than others. So we spend a lot of time in advanced manufacturing, a lot of time in alt PNT, fair amount of time in uh, kinetics. So things that go boom, uh, mostly because other investors tend to not like those or aren't allowed to invest in those spaces. So we think there's, there's definitely a need and uh, we think there's an opportunity. Aerospace, you know, stuff that you'd expect a, an investor in defense to invest in. For our next fund, which we're hopefully going to be deploying again in uh, Q2 of this year, we'll be mostly Series A focused. Um, so we'll still do some seed deals. We're moving a little bit later. And that's a result of, um, as I said earlier, you know, there's a, a much more crowded environment in pre-seed and seed in defense. 
And uh, it's less that I don't want to invest in those companies. It's more that I am worried that the Series A it doesn't have anybody there to to invest in companies, um, or there are very few Series A leads focused on defense today. And so I'm worried there's going to be a crunch in 12 to 18 months. So a lot of the companies that raised seed rounds, I think, a year ago, when they come to raise their Series A in defense, there's not going to be a lot of people there to meet them. We want to make sure they don't slip through the cracks. Interesting. Can you walk us through sort of like you mentioned, like obviously Joe Lonsdale's fund, HVC, you've got Sequoia writing checks and Dreesen. What do you mean by there's not going to be a lot of Series A funds who are investing earlier? Are those funds not investing at the Series A fund? No, no, they are for sure, but they're not specialists in the sector, okay. right? I think Sean McGuire at Sequoia is very, very sharp, certainly knows defense very well. So he may as well be a specialist. The American Dynamism team, obviously great. Founders Fund, you know, I think Trey is maybe the, the best investor in the space. Very cynical, but I, I'm i getting more and more cynical too. So I totally get it. The problem is that those are large multi-stage firms. They don't focus on defense. And that's not to say that they don't have an expertise in it. It is to say that how many defense deals are they going to get through every year? Sean McGuire can't push through four loitering munition companies next year. He's got mock. How many more is, are his Sequoia partners going to let him put through? When they're not a defense specialist, yes, those firms are there. Or yes, they're going to do deals in the space, but the number of checks they will write at Series A to lead around, I think, is is pretty limited. Talk to me about how the portfolio kind of uh, benefits off each other. What's the synergies you see with all the companies you've invested in, given that there's obviously some either overlap in what their either products are doing or the strategies that they're deploying? What kind of like uh, synergies are you able to see from the portfolio because you're so focused on defense tech? I mean, I mean a ton. Um, it really helps to be focused in this sector. Uh, I mean, the first, which is more a, a synergy around our own work, is probably congressional synergy, right? I mean, we know many of the members of Hask and Sask, and those members are the ones that all of our companies need to talk to. That's that's pretty helpful, I think, being able to consolidate those uh, legislative affairs efforts. But definitely product synergy as well, right? Gotenna is one of our portfolio companies. They make a phenomenal mesh networking technology. They're in talks with a lot of both portfolio companies and other companies in the space about putting their networking nodes on autonomous vehicles of one sort or another, and then using those to drive capability for for both the platform and for Gotenna itself, right? So it's a great example of a company that should be incorporated in a lot of what we're doing. We didn't invest in any alt PNT solutions last year. Um, and for those who you know don't have acronym soup uh, memorized, it's that's alternative positioning, navigation, and timing. So think. GPS replacements. Looked at a ton of those companies. You know, every one of those companies is a, a component. So it needs to integrate with somebody else. And we have lots of those somebody else's in the portfolio. This is a space where very few people build a fully integrated solution. DOD buys fully integrated solutions. So at the end of the day, you either need to be an Android and be fully vertically integrated, or you need to partner with other companies that turn your capability into a solution to a problem. Because DOD doesn't like to actually do that integration work if they can avoid it. You know, speak of Anduril, you know, there is something that I've been thinking about, and I'm sure a lot of people are questioning the same thing that maybe you have some insight on is like, how are we, you know, and I say we like the Western world still spending tens of millions, if not billions on defense to take down a thousand dollar drone, you know, fired by the Houthis on our, you know, large hundred million dollar shipping vehicles. We are victims of our own success, right? I mean, our, our last 30 years, we've had no, no significant opponents, right? Not to say that American lives weren't lost fighting the Taliban and Al-Qaeda, but from an economic perspective, right? And like your military ultimately is a function of your economy. Like your ability to fight wars is a function of your ability to supply your troops with materiel and food, right? It's the, the old quip about logistics being where the real experts focus, right? Well, when you're fighting Afghanistan, which had a GDP of, I don't know, $500, or $1,000 a year, right? You can afford to use a million-dollar Hellfire or a $200,000 Hellfire to take out a $10,000 piece of material because our economy is so much larger than their economy and their ability to resupply. That breaks down when your primary uh, antagonist is China and their economy is quite large. Their ability to produce new things is extreme. And from a cost per capability perspective, their costs are much lower than our costs, right? And so we have to transition from uh, use maximum overkill, just save as many American lives as you can, doesn't matter what it costs, just spend the money and we'll win that way 
to a paradigm of the cost to close a kill chain matters, right? So we need to make sure that the dollars we spend to accomplish a mission are less than the dollars our opponents spend to resist that mission. Um, and that's not something we've had to think about uh, since the end of the Cold War. And really, we weren't thinking about it in the Cold War. I mean, to some degree, that's how we won the Cold War, is to just outspend the the Soviets. So it's a, it's a very different way for Americans to think about things. It, it seems counterintuitive to the big five primes in the way that they are almost incentivized and also compensated and structured uh, because of how much they've outsourced and how much they gobble up of the entire budget. You know, it's like the saying, everything in government that you look at that they pay for has gone up in, you know, 10 to 100x more than everything else for the cost of living. But everything from technology that is being privately built and, and funded, like cell phones and, and television sets, have gone down 90% in cost from what they were before adjusted for inflation. So like, where does that alignment happen if we're doing one thing but wanting the other? The real problem is, uh, there's lots of real problems. One of the real problems is cost plus contracting. So if your contract is, we will pay you a 10% margin on whatever your costs are, how do you raise your top line? The only way to raise your top line is you increase your costs, uh, which is exactly the opposite of the way like 99% of business operates. So, you know, why do we do that? We do that or we did that because we, we, the government needed companies to take outsized risks to build big things. And those companies couldn't afford the risk. We said, all right, we, the government will bear all the risk of getting the thing done. But if we're going to bear all the risk, we are going to cap your upside. That seems reasonable but it leads to perverse incentives. The flip side is, is firm fixed price, where a company says, I'll deliver capability X at price Y, and I'll bear all the risk, but whatever margin is left is my margin, right? So maybe I don't make 10%, maybe I make 70%, right? And that's how startups operate. The primes in the last five years have tried to do more firm fixed price. There was pressure to get them to do it. They tried, they have lost, tens, if not hundreds of billions of dollars trying to do firm fixed price. And do you think that's because it's the labor cost and the unions and all that stuff that is going into their inputs into their cogs that they just have no control over? Honestly, I have no idea. If I'm speculating, I'm going to say they have built for 30 years an organization that didn't care about cost. And so it's hard to pivot on one or two contracts and not the whole business around a firm fixed price model. But I have no idea what's going on internally. Yeah, I think it's it's probably, yeah, you're right. We don't know exactly what's going on internally. But when China is your biggest you know, adversary, competitor, whatever you want to name it, and their cost is like one-tenth the cost of ours to build the same sort of thing, like it's it's like what Elon Musk is going up against now. You know, He's not worried about the American unionized electric car manufacturers. He's probably worried more about the, the, the spin-outs coming out of China that are probably stealing his IP and building it for one tenth of the cost. That's his, you know, probably biggest thing that's keeping him up at night. And so I, I agree, like, you know, it's not exactly their fault. They were built like this for the last 30 years. And so just changing the top line motivation doesn't trickle through the whole organization. But hey, I digress. We can talk about that forever. Yeah, I mean, it's a super interesting question. And, and I'm sure you're right. Some of it's got to be unionization and cost of raw materials here versus in China. And I mean, there's lots of stuff going on, but yeah, I mean, like I would say like Ray Dalio's obviously Changing World Order book talks a bit about this, right? Like the the economy and the society becomes a little bit lazy and overzealous with a lot of the things they have going right that they don't focus on what things are going wrong. They get wars fought overseas that drag them into other conflicts and just everything starts to trickle through and it's really hard to see a change be made in the last 10 years of a hundred year cycle uh, to reverse that trend. But, uh, you know, you wrote a post about the VC math for defense investing. Uh, which was taken from the, the VC math uh, post that we saw prior. You know, can you share a bit more about your portfolio construction at Mark and you know how you think about playing the power law game in the defense tech investing world? I've come across a number of folks who are investing in defense and a number of LPs that they've talked to these people. Um, and they say, is defense different? Like, should we expect fewer failures in this market, but maybe less, less top end return, right? So Fewer 100x exits, but fewer failures. Should your returns look different? Should the power law curve be depressed a little bit? And then I hear the anecdotal or sort of the subjective arguments for why that might be, right? Government's a good customer. Once you get them, you have all this non dilute financing. Like there's other things at play. So like, okay, you can make the case that the market will look a little bit different. And that I think is the predominant narrative amongst other fund managers who are talking about defense tech, because that's the only thing I'm hearing as pushback. I think that that's bollocks. I think it's weird to say this is the way venture works in all industries, 
but it's going to be different in this one industry. Yes, this industry is, is different. You need to start from perspective of, well, what does 20 years of, of venture math show us? And we're going to assume that defense is going to be different. And if, we, if we're if we going to make the argument that it's not, you need to show me why it's not. And then I'd say, all right, let's look at the examples that we have, right? This is a relatively new industry in for in terms of like venture relevance. So we have to look at relatively new examples of what's going on. If you look at relatively new examples, there's four or five companies that are worth more than a billion dollars that are hyperscaling companies. There's Anderil and Shield and Epirus and like a handful of others, right? Palantir, slightly older example, but we'll count it. The texture of returns in defense, in venture, look exactly like a power law distribution. And so if you're going to make the argument that venture, defense venture shouldn't be power law, it should be a little bit different. I think you've got to show me examples where that's playing out, right? Like show me a curve that's flatter and that's not the curve I see. So I, I say, no, I think this looks just like every other venture industry, despite all the weirdness in defense. Interesting. So how does M&A play a role in your strategy? You know, we've got the five defense primes, you know, Northrop Grumman, Raytheon, everyone knows them, Lockheed Martin, and so on. Are they your target buyers for M&A if you are trying to find exits and liquidity? Like, how are you thinking about that in this industry and whatever needs to be approved? I'm hoping for IPOs, but, you know, obviously uh, that's those are few and far between. And so most of your exits you're going to see are going to come from M&A. I'd prefer our M&A to not be with the major prime contractors, um, not because I don't like them. I think there's lots of lovely people working there. But for the most part, they do not pay great multiples when they acquire startups. That's largely a result of the way that Wall Street values them. So because they're cost plus contractors and their their margins are slim, they're valued at 1x to 2x revenue. That means that they are unlikely to acquire companies for much more than that. Because if you if you pay 10x for someone's revenue to acquire them, and then the next day you are valued at 1x that acquired revenue, you've you've just destroyed right off 90%. <laughs> right. <laughs> you've destroyed stock stock value, stockholder value. Like literally the stock price will come down because of what you have just done. And that's short-term thinking for sure. But when you are evaluated on a quarterly basis, it incentivizes organizations to think short-term. So they don't pay great prices. I'm an optimist. I think that's changing. One, because you know Anderil and Shield and companies like them are becoming more acquisitive and they are willing to pay good multiples for companies that will drive their top line. They don't want to overpay, like you know, no one wants to overpay, but they're more flexible in the way they pay because they're still valued like tech companies. My thesis is that that ultimately will drive the primes to be more competitive in M&A processes, right? Like I think that they need to acquire new technology to stay competitive. If there is a robust acquisition ecosystem outside the primes that are starting to die or eat into the primes ability to innovate through M&A, they will have to become competitive in those bidding processes. And so I think we're like seeing this start to play out now. And that's like one of the bets in the defense sector that you're making if you're investing in the space is that the exit environment matures and looks more like the rest of venture. Because um, today it's it's still not great. Interesting though, even though that Wall Street will not reward you for that strategic acquisition that you paid twenty five x revenue for because you're valued at one to two x revenue, you're saying in the long term it's going to help the incumbents, the primes, stay competitive against the larger pre IPO Andrews of the world. Is that like what you think is happening, or is that what will happen because? those are the only two buyers that can actually buy these companies. Like there's there's no other strategics. There's no private equity buyers necessarily. Who is the market to buy these companies if it's not the private large Andrews of the world or the primes? Yeah, I mean, that is essentially what I'm saying, that, okay. that pressure from the Andrews of the world will drive the primes to, to pay up. You know, if the primes are savvy, and I think that they are, that what they're going to have to do is they're going to have to educate Wall Street on their acquisition so that they do get the value of the... And it, and it probably... They're probably going to think about how they integrate acquisitions, right? So maybe we don't bring them in under our cost plus structure, but we run them as semi-autonomous organizations that are still getting 50% margins and growing 50% year over year. But and then, so they, then they benefit from the IP. That makes a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. So I, I mean, I again, I think a lot of what we're basing our thesis on are things that I think are immovable object meeting unstoppable force is just going to drive certain behaviors. And we're just starting to see evidence of those behaviors. And so this is a, we are making a, 
an educated bet on the way the market's going to look five years from now. In five years, if the market looks like it looks today, is it smart to be investing in defense? I probably wouldn't want to answer that question on air. It's a hard question to answer, but I think all the signs are there to say that investing today in defense is going to drive massive returns in five years and 10 years. Yeah. The other thing I would say about investing in defense that like I would never be able to do is you almost have this like private public hedge where like if you can prove yourself out in the public side with like the DOD contracts, you still have a huge private market that you can also sell to as well. You know, it's it's kind of like what SpaceX has done, for example, like getting those early NASA contracts to save them to be able to, you know, do the missions that obviously NASA wasn't able to do themselves and then use that revenue to build out a private and, you know, consumer focused business to set, launch satellites and to launch Starlink and all those other things could also be a much larger TAM that you would not necessarily have thought of going into just a pure defense DOD type of business, right? Right. And I think the SpaceX example is a good one of exactly how quote unquote dual use should be thought of. It's not, I'm going to build a commercial product and a uh, a defense product concurrently because no startup can afford to do that. You can't have two product teams. No one product is perfect for DOD and for the consumer market. It's very rare. Uh, And you can't afford two sales teams, right? Selling to the government looks entirely different from every other sales motion. It needs two different teams of experts. You can't afford it. So the way to do it is what SpaceX said, exactly what you just said. Build a product for a customer that really wants it, make it work, grow it to scale, And once you're successful doing that, you can start expanding on your core technology to adjacent markets. And that's how you build a really big business, for sure. The other part of it is, is that if you're not able to get through the DOD in the first couple of years, because there's either just bureaucracy or just like budget approvals or just timing, there are still other markets with other foreign governments that don't have access to the same IP that you're building that will take a chance. Maybe it's a smaller contract. But hey, 250K, 500K contracts with foreign governments is something you could also get revenue out of, right? For sure. When you start introducing foreign sales, I mean, there's all sorts of other stuff you have to start dealing with depending on the kind of technology you're developing, right? I mean, if you're dealing with something that's controlled by ITAR, it can be very sticky. If you're doing a a direct sale of, of military hardware to another country, you have to run through State Department and it it adds complexity to the business, but certainly you know, the U.S. defense market is, like I said, 900 billion, we'll call it a trillion. The allied defense market's about 2 trillion, right? It's it's quite the market. And uh, you're missing out if you're only trying to focus in the U.S. You should definitely be looking abroad. It's just a matter of timing in terms of like how you how you manage that. Yeah. One question for you is, you know, how are you navigating the LPs that are maybe unable to invest in defense tech? Like, is that a quick filter that you have to do when you're raising, you know, capital from LPs? I don't think I've ever been on a call with an LP who couldn't invest in defense, mostly because we are so clear about what we do. I think we uh, we get filtered out early in the process if they can't invest in defense. Self-selection. Yeah. Um, so it probably saves us time. That makes sense. Two last questions. You know, What advice are you giving to entrepreneurs looking to get started in making a significant impact in defense tech? And you know, what areas or trends would you guide people to say, this is an area you know I would build in or I think you should be focusing on if they were looking to get started today? Talk to a lot of end users. So whatever you're building, you have to go find the people in the department that are going to use it. It's like, sounds like, I don't know, standard advice or basic advice in every other sector. Like VCs are going to tell you, like, go talk to end users, let them shape what it is that you're building, your MVP. It's harder to do in defense. If your end user is, you know, a SEAL team, you have to know people who know people that are going to put you in front of the team and like let them kick the tires. But you 100% have to do it. You can't avoid it and just think you're going to sell because you've got a four-star general on your advisory board. It doesn't work. You need people at the top and people at the bottom, both pushing if you want to work in this market. There are a lot of advisory boards with a lot of stars on them in companies that aren't going to go anywhere. It doesn't really help you. And then if I were starting a company today, I've got a million ideas, um, but I think the space that's most interesting is in um, manufacturing. What I really think we need for defense is a TSMC for defense. I don't mean a semiconductor company, a fab. What TSMC, like their their core value proposition, what they realized is that they should, uh, or the industry was um, was in need of someone to divide the value proposition or the value chain between the IP and the design of chips 
in the manufacturing of chips, right? And so they created like the really the first, not fabulous, I don't know what you'd call it. The, the, I mean, the first just uh, designless fab, right? White labeled chip manufacturer. I think we need something similar for defense, right? We need someone who doesn't worry about the design of a particular drone or autonomous system or missile or whatever it is, is just there to manufacture and works with all of the startups in the space. So you could think of them like a prime contractor, almost an integrator. Foxconn? Yeah, Foxconn. (laughs) Um, Lots of examples out there in other industries, but really focused on working with the smaller defense contractors out there and helping them scale manufacturing. Interesting. It's almost like an AWS for defense contracting manufacturing, you know, you know, rent their uh, manufacturing capabilities uh, and then you build the IP and the design uh, for your own private company. It makes a lot of sense. I like that idea. One thing is you've got your own podcast. Uh, it's called The Merge. You know, how has co-hosting your own podcast? I, you know, I've seen you've had uh, Delian from Varda Space on. You know, how has that helped bring awareness to one in defense tech investing and also just educating more LPs about the opportunities of investing in the space? I'll say right up front, uh, The Merge is, is Mike Benitez's podcast. He does all all the work. Paco does all the work. I just, I'm blessed to get to co-host. You're just yeah, a pretty I'm just, face. I'm a pretty face. <laughs> I say the stuff that he's afraid to say um, on air, but we might whisper about um, when we're not on air. It's great. I mean, the audience for The Merge is um, pretty wonky. So we've got a lot of people inside the Pentagon, um, a lot of folks in the industry at the Primes. And so we get you get a fair amount of feedback from those sorts of folks. And it's, it's great distribution into that very specific sector. I don't know that uh, we have a whole lot of founders who follow. It's hard to say. I, fewer founders bring up the merge. It's mostly Govies who talk to us about it. Well, hopefully there's some founders here are thinking about building a defense tech listening. We'll j- check it out and, and maybe be your next portfolio company for your next fund. You know, before we wrap things up, we always ask our guests for their fast favorites. So first off, your favorite podcast. Obviously, the merge is number one. What's number two? So a uh, podcast called The Pitch, which is like a shark tank. Still around? I thought that was like, that was Gimlet Media acquired. I remember I had a friend on that like 10 years ago. It was, it was. It was acquired by Gimlet. Um, but then my buddy, Josh Muccio, who produced that podcast, he left and he was able to reacquire the podcast from Gimlet. They're relatively early in their new journey, but it's it's still around. And uh, Josh is a great guy and they, they do a good job. Yeah, got to check that one out again. Next is your favorite newsletter or blog. The Merge newsletter comes out every Sunday. It's like the one thing I 100% make sure I read um, because it's a good snapshot of what's going on in the defense world. Pete Medigliani does a defense uh, news roundup every Saturday. It's the inbox. It's the other thing that I read every week. It's a great summary of all the important things going on in defense. If you read those, if you read the Merge in Pete's newsletter, like you really don't need to read anything else. Nice. Next is your favorite tech gadget. I mean, it's got to be the iPhone, right? It's the thing that I spend so much of my time on. I wish it were something else. Maybe it's the Switch, you know, a little Fortnite at night to to blow off steam. But um, it's probably the iPhone. You don't have the new Vision Pros? No, I can't wait to play with it. But So I saw, uh, speaking of defense tech, one of uh, the guy we had on the podcast, uh, Glenn Cowan from One Nine Ventures, SEAL team, you know, Special Forces, Canadian Armed Forces, uh, his partner wore them during a uh, like shooting exercise at a shooting range. And was able to sort of use that as a way of coaching and like multitasking uh, in the field uh, while obviously uh, executing a mission, mock mission. Very interesting. So do you think they'll play a role in uh, the defense and, and in, you know, potential DOD contracts? Oh, it's a loaded question, right? I mean, we had the IVAS program that Microsoft ran for a long time. And uh, that's just, it's been a disaster. I think if you talk to someone and they're being nice, what they'd say is we learned a lot out of that program. And we weren't necessarily expecting to put a visor on everyone's face, but we know how to do it now if we were to start again. Maybe someday it gets there. You know, we've got the Halo-esque super soldier with a, a Vision right. Pro. That's what I want to think of. Next is your favorite new trend? I don't know. I could be the cop out and say generative AI. I love it. You know, in a, in a good way. I mean, I think there's lots of bad about generative AI for sure. Most of the content I think it produces is is like 40 to 60 percentile kind of content. So it's hard to say you hate it, but also like I don't want to read it. So I worry that someday all content is going to be plain vanilla generative AI. Completely unauthentic too. Yeah. And almost definitionally no original thought. Right. Right. Totally. But what I like about generative AI, the way I use it is I love it for image generation because when I'm doing a little writing or a blog post or something, I can create like what I'm seeing in my brain because I'm not at all artistic. So I can't do it 
myself, but I can do a little prompt engineering and crank out an image and that, that tickles me. So it's good for the non-creatives. Um, I agree. What, uh, what are you using for image generation the most? Dolly, I think is what I, I mostly use. Nice. Uh, favorite new book or favorite book? So my favorite book is called Tuxedo Park. It is a biography of Alfred Loomis. Alfred Loomis was one of the wealthiest men in America in the 20s and 30s, investment banker. But his real passion was that he was a citizen scientist. So he set up a lab in Tuxedo Park, New York. Uh, he invited the top scientists of the world to come and spend a summer or a winter or whatever in his in the lap of luxury and funded their projects. Alfred Loomis was really close with Vannevar Bush, with uh, Ernest Lawrence, with uh, the folks who created Radar. He funded a lot of those projects. He was actually, I think, he is the unsung hero of World War II because he brought most of the people who built the stuff that we used to win the war, he brought them together and he funded their research. But he hated the spotlight. So he did it, he funded it, and then he stayed out of the spotlight as, as much as he could. How is there no movie on this? I, I have no idea, but I highly recommend the book. I like the story because, uh, you know, the investor was the hero in this story, and it's pretty rare when that happens. And he owned, he owned none of the IP. Like, he just did the wet lab space for free, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was just his passion. I mean, he was a scientist as well. He's got a bunch of patents, but he just wanted to fund really cool research. I mean, he funded the Rad Lab that created radar. Wow. He funded the first cyclotron that Ernest Lawrence used to start gathering the, the material we needed for the nuclear bomb. Yeah, so, I mean, Oppenheimer, you know, obviously, you know, headline movie. What, why is this not out there as the next one? Makes no sense. Uh, and last but not least is your favorite life lesson. You don't get what you don't ask for. So it's easy to self-sabotage. Uh, you need to just sort of get out there and, and say what you need, what you want, and uh, let the universe respond. I love it. That's amazing. Thanks so much for joining us in the tag today with Jake Chapman from Mark Ventures. Hey, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Tank Talks. We hope you found today's conversation as insightful as we did. If you're enjoying the show, we've got three quick things to ask of you. First, hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast platform so you never miss an episode, whether that's Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or YouTube. Next, follow us and stay up to date on upcoming episodes and behind-the-scenes content on social media with Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And lastly, share the love. If you found value in today's episode, share with a friend or colleague who'd benefit too. Your support helps us bring in more amazing guests and keeps the Tank Talks engine running. That's it for today. Until next time, keep disrupting and innovating.